everyone, Blue Goblin here. Thank you for joining me for my comic book review for this week in December 2011. Uh, if you saw the beginning of this video, yeah, um, Mr. Robinson. Uh, wow. You were a legend in the comic book industry and I would like to personally thank you for your contributions to comics you will be missed thank you for everything you've given us alright another thing I want to say uh, I just posted a written review for Action Comics number 4 on my Tumblr page so go check that out uh, Action Comics number 4 actually came pretty damn close to being the pick of the week Had the, it probably would have made it if the story wasn't so jumbled up and if it didn't uh, end on a cliffhanger that needs to be concluded three issues later. That didn't make any sense to me. But what beat it out was this. The pick of the week is The Amazing Spider-Man 675, the world's greatest superhero. Yeah, I'm a fanboy. Uh, Dan Slott, Giuseppe Camuncoli. I probably mispronounced the artist's name, and I'm sorry if I did. But I want to give the artist credit. His artwork was fantastic in this issue. Dan Slott's artwork, uh, Dan, artwork, writing, no pun intended, is nothing short of amazing. This was fantastic. I loved every page of this. This was incredible. Uh, I love the, the new tweaks and twists with the original Vulture, Adrian Toomes. It's good to see him again. Uh, good dialogue from almost everybody in this book, especially from Peter concerning his his conflict with the vulture in here. Um, Carly Cooper is actually growing on me a little bit more ever since their ever since her breakup with Peter. And it's to me, it's nice to see okay, Peter and Carly have broken up. They're no longer technically dating, but they are still friendly with each other and there's no ill will, there's no grudge. There are a few surprises between the two of them, especially from for Carly, because Carly's still learning stuff about Peter's double life as Spider-Man. But it's nice to see that, you know, yeah, it kind of takes away from the realism a bit, but it's nice to see that there's no ill will, there's no grudges, you know. It's like they dated for a while, and now they're simply just friends again. And that's, that's okay. I, I can live with that, because Carly... Carly was just an okay girlfriend. Um, but everything about this is really, really well done. And during the conflict with the Vulture, there's a bit of a of an old school dramatic moment concerning the Vulture in here. I'm not going to give it away, but it was awesome. I loved it. The artwork in here meshed with the storytelling that, that is, that's being presented. And this issue ends on a laugh. And on a very dramatic laugh, too. Carly decides to turn to someone to learn more about Peter Parker's life and I'm not going to give it away but who better who better to go to you know it's like who Carly decides to talk to was the perfect choice in my opinion and the the last panel it makes the issue end on a laugh my Peter Parker sense is tingling just great funny stuff I loved it this was this was awesome Nearly got beat by Action Comics 4, but this Amazing Spider-Man 675, pick of the week. Alright, next up, X-Factor 228. This is the conclusion of X is, uh, with X-Factor's fight with Bloodbath, and it's a bittersweet victory. It's a very bittersweet victory. And I'm pretty much, I, I don't want to actually say what happens and I don't want to spoil it, but I'm willing to bet odds are you've probably read this book by now. And those of you who have, you already know what I'm talking about. And if you take a good look at the, if you take a really close look at the cover, odds are you probably know what happens in this book. And it's a really bittersweet moment for the team. Other than that, the fight itself was pretty damn good. Uh, this is still Peter David's great style of writing. Uh, it, it doesn't end on a cliffhanger, but it ends on a very sad note for the team. A very, very sad note. Um, and I'm not going to say I smell a retcon for this, because I really can't say... I can't really 
truly say that for this. And we learned a couple of new things about Layla Miller that I wasn't expecting. Uh, the first thing I learned, I kind of, I kind of guessed it, but then the second thing just came out of nowhere for me. And um, uh, with a couple of her, ta with one of her talents at least, we see what the side effect is, and it, it, it does make sense for what it is. All in all, this was a good issue, very good issue, but a very bittersweet ending. All right, Venom number ten. Now, here's here's another reason why I love Rick Remender's writing for Venom. Issue number nine was perfect. It was perfect for me in almost every way. And Rick Remender, he does the right thing with this issue. He pulls it back a little bit. He knows, or at least based on this issue, he knows you don't want you don't necessarily need to give your readers a jaw-dropping story every single issue because then it becomes repetitive then it becomes expected and if you don't deliver once it becomes expected that's when the series will start to look stale to your readers he did the right thing here issue with what happened in issue 9 here he pulls it back but he still keeps the book interesting enough to say to make you go yeah I loved this book I love this series and that's how I feel about this issue. It's a short and simple issue for Venom number 10. It ends on a pretty pretty interesting cliffhanger. It's a fight with Captain America. I'll go ahead and spoil that. But it's short, it's simple, and it's right to the point, and I loved it. It's good to see that Flash, Tom can, Flash Thompson can hold his own against Captain America while at the same try, at the same time try to maintain his struggle with the symbiote itself. It's very well done. It doesn't seem rushed. It doesn't seem flat. It's very, very good writing from Rick Remender. And after reading ever since issue one to now, I am convinced that I don't think anybody can in this day and age can write Venom better than Rick Remender. I don't even think Dan Slott can top this kind of storytelling for Venom. All right, Static Shock number four. Caught in the grip of Guillotina, an interesting villain. Not much is not can't say anything about her right now. She's just she's just air right now because this is her first issue. But the thing is, uh, my whole gripe about Static Shock these first four issues is that I believe DC can can do so much better with this. I kind of feel like DC's kind of holding back. I know we're only four issues in, but look what DC's been doing for the past. For the past Batman books ever since this new 52 started. If they can do shit like that for Batman and shit like this for Superman, they can really beef up Static really well. He's no longer a hero on his own in Dakota. Now he's in New York as a former Teen Titan trying to reestablish himself as a solo hero. And I feel like DC could do a better job with the writing. I really do. And Scott McDaniel's artwork, I may have praised it when it was done in Detective Comics, but here, the more I see it, the more I don't like it. And still, I still, my biggest nitpick is that Static Shock still looks like fucking Curly Sue with the damn hair. It's really ridiculous. The more I see this artwork, the more I have a problem with it. It's starting to look too cartoony. You know, even for a superhero that had good cartoon. And at the end of the book, Static, to me, in my opinion, looks a little bit reckless, which explains how the cliffhanger came to be. But all in all, this book was good, but the whole series overall, I feel, could be better than it is. Justice League International, number four. Uh, Dan, uh, Dan Jurgens, Aaron Leprosti, uh, Lopresti, yeah. I uh, love the David Finch cover. Um, okay, this was a this was a step up from issue three. Uh, we get some get some more developments to the whole Signal Men story, and we finally we finally get something from Godiva. She finally does something for the benefit of the team. Yet at the same time, she still comes off as a massive flirt. You know, she does just one minor thing right for the team, and it's still, to me, 
doesn't make her look like a credible hero for this team or a credible uh, addition for this team. Good stuff from Fire, from Ice, from Red Rocket. Great stuff from Guy Gardner. Uh, some good dialogue between Booster Gold and Batman. All in all, this was a very good issue with a very old school type of cliffhanger, you know? Very old school type of cliffhanger, and it works for this. This was very, very good. In my opinion, this was much better than issue three. I still have some minor nitpicks about it, but I won't go into detail about it. Um, still waiting on some. Still waiting to see if Godiva, if I can take Godiva seriously as a character, because right now I still am not. And they need to find a new name for the August General in Iron, because that is a really lame name, but that's just. Uh, that's it. That's it for the minor nitpicking. All in all, I did enjoy this issue. It was a fun read. Very good stuff from Dan Jurgens. Uh, I say go ahead and give it a give it a shot. All right, Red Lanterns number four, Jennifer Sweetheart. If you're watching this video, you might not want to listen to what I have to say because I'm willing to bet you still haven't read your copy of Red Lanterns. But but for the rest of you. I will say this. This was this was good. This was really good stuff from Peter Milligan and Ed Bennis. The artwork, very well done. Uh, the biggest problem I hear with it is there's just too much red. Well, the title's called Red Lantern, so what do you expect? The thing is, this heart hardly has any focus at all on Bleas and some good focus on Atrocitus, but the main focus is this is basically another this is more one of those backstory issues where we get backstory for three other members of the Red Lantern Corps. And the way the backstories are told for how they ended up becoming Red Lanterns in the end is it actually, it, it the storytelling works for me. It captivated me, it kept me reading, it was really good, and then I got to the cliffhanger. Oh my God! The cliffhanger was, this was a, the cliffhanger for me was a what the fuck moment. Now, I believe, after seeing that cliffhanger, that this series can go could go even further than I expected it to go. I'm really excited to read the next couple of issues after seeing the cliffhanger. This was good. Peter Milligan, good job. We're going to end this here with Detective Comics number four. Uh, yeah. What more can I say about Tony Daniels' writing and his artwork? Now, not everybody likes Tony Daniels' writing, and not everybody likes his artwork. But me, myself, I gotta be honest, I'm enjoying this. This was good. Good, gritty, dark storytelling is, you know, and that's what a Batman book should should be. It should be dark, it should be gritty, it should have that drama, it should have that action. Have some slight comedy in there, but make it all about the action-packed, detective-skilled storytelling. That's what I love about Batman. And Tony Daniel knows his homework here. He does it very well. He has he distinguishes a distinction between the characters of Bruce Wayne and Batman. Here the past year or so, whenever I see Bruce Wayne, he would usually be in his bat suit but without the mask on, he would just be talking like Batman. Here, I see, when I see Bruce Wayne, I mean I see Bruce Wayne, the pill, the billionaire playboy who's probably seen more asses than a toilet seat. This, I, even though it was very, very brief, I saw Bruce Wayne in here. And when I saw Batman, the action was good, the storytelling was good, the drama was good, his detective skills were very, very well represented, and I am now taking the Dollmaker completely seriously as a credible Batman villain for the Rogues Gallery. I, you know, when I first heard about a doll maker, I was thinking, oh, he's going to be like the next Maxi Zeus or whatever. But no, I put him up there with guys like Penguin and Riddler. I think he is now a serious, credible threat to Batman. Very awesome storytelling with the, uh, with the doll maker. And uh, just the last page was a reminder of what's been going on since issue one. And it was a nice little reminder, and I just loved that image at the end. Detective Comics, number four. Really, really good book. Could have been a pick of the week, but it got beat. And I gotta say, if you've been if you've been with Detective Comics before, stick with it. It's still really, really good. Well, that's all I got, everybody. Don't forget to subscribe. Thanks for watching, and until next time, I'll see you later.